The purpose of conventional randomised control trials is to compare treatments to see if one of them is better. In other words, to show if one treatment causes a better outcome than another treatment. The technical term for this is to make a causal inference, or to infer that a treatment causes an improved outcome. We saw in the video on serial binary trials how conventional trials and negative feedback shift pre-trial zones of equipoise towards the point where two treatments are equivalent. Null-seeking trials are based on the idea of making this null-seeking effect, rather than a causal inference, the purpose of a trial. They are therefore designed to maximise convergence of equipoise on null, rather than to maximise the chance of a causal inference. We also saw in the video on serial trials how the perceived spectrum of indication changes in the light of one trial and before the next. But for a trial in surgery, from design to publication of the results typically takes 10 years or more. The most radical departure that null-seeking trials make from binary trial design is intended to make this feedback faster. With a null-seeking trial, the result is updated and made public as the outcome for each individual patient becomes available to allow rapid convergence between equipoise as perceived by surgeon-patient combinations and a point where treatments are truly equivalent, the null point. For binary trials, this is a complete no-no. For these, the results are kept strictly confidential from everybody except a small number of people, usually the data manager and the members of the safety monitoring committee. They are only made public when all the results have been gathered and analysed. This is done to prevent the exact effect that null-seeking trials aim to maximise, that is to allow existing results to influence future recruitment and thus influence the trial result. A zone of equipoise within a spectrum of indication, ranging from indication to contraindication, is a more prominent feature in surgery than in medicine. This is because surgical operations have inescapable risks that are dependent on operator skill and coexisting morbidity other than the disease being treated by the operation. For a patient at high risk from surgery or anaesthesia, but with little to gain from the operation, surgery is not indicated. Conversely, for patients at low risk with much to gain from surgery, it is indicated. Between these extremes lies a spectrum of varying strength of indication. At points on this spectrum, indication turns to equipoise and then to contraindication. Essential to null-seeking trials is making this spectrum explicit. The null-seeking trial model is based on a quantifiable outcome which is modelled as a function of a numerical index of the strength of the indication for surgery. Here is an example we've seen before of the type of functions involved, in this case in the treatment of unruptured intracranial aneurysms. The outcome variable is remaining life expectancy in years, and the index is simply age. These curves represent estimates of the kind of functions whose crossing point the null-seeking trial is designed to define. Incidentally, the idea of a null point as a zero crossing point is fine in theory, but in practice the outcome measures used in trials are often fairly crude and do not accurately reflect the whole patient experience of the treatment and its outcome. The life expectancy example here takes no account of the immediate stress, discomfort and inconvenience associated with undergoing a major brain operation, including the loss of a driving licence for 6 to 12 months. Most patients would not go through that for a theoretical week or two of life extension. A year or more and they may be tempted. So in practice the null point may not be the crossing point, but the point at which the patient feels the treatment's advantages are enough to balance its disadvantages. Features can be added to this basic description to improve the utility of null-seeking trials. A key one is that all patients treated should be included rather than only those who are randomised. Our research into patient opinion indicates that typically around 10% of patients would choose randomisation. Here we return to the hypothetical line seen in the video on serial trials. A coding system is used to differentiate between patients who are selected to have a treatment and those who are randomised to it. Randomised cases are shown as solid squares and non-randomised as hollow squares. Surgical cases are shown in green and medical in red. If the clinician's impressions of which treatment is indicated are correct, we would expect to see a substantial non-randomised group of cases having treatment S towards the right-hand side of the graph and a substantial non-randomised group of cases having treatment M towards the left-hand side. The coding system allows the randomised cases to be looked at in isolation, avoiding allocation bias, or all cases to be looked at together, helping to define the lines outside the zone of equipoise.
The degree of allocation bias introduced by the selection of cases can be modelled and measured by comparing the lines for randomised and selected cases. For example, if the line plotted for treatment M with only randomised cases included is in a different position from that for treatment M plotted with all cases or with only non-randomised cases, it indicates that selection is occurring to a degree that is quantifiable by the difference between the lines. I will return to this in more detail in a future video. It may help to look at how this would work in practice. A null-seeking trial would be run as an internet website. When a patient agrees to participate, their details, including factors that influence the index of indication, would be entered. The investigating clinician and patient then refer to a display of results of the trial gathered so far. This is a plot of outcomes for other cases in the trial on the y-axis against their index of indication on the x-axis. The value of the index for the patient being considered is shown, and the data displayed includes those from patients who have been randomised and from patients who have selected their treatment. On the strength of the results viewed, the investigating clinician and patient decide whether to have treatment S or treatment M or to be randomised. They go on to have their treatment and their outcome is measured and added to the database. At the start of a null-seeking trial, there would be a delay before results became available and during this time conventional decision-making would apply. Note that there is no need for the index of indication to be defined in the same way for all participating clinicians or patients. It could be a function of variables including patient age, sex, their general condition and the severity of the disease being treated. As long as the necessary data is collected from all patients participating in the trial, several functions of one or more of these data variables could be used as the index of indication, the multiple linear regression model for outcome prediction being an obvious one. Investigators would be encouraged to select their preferred index and often to revisit the issue about what index to use. This diversity would benefit the trial because it would widen the range of individual indices over which randomization was done making it easier to define these lines as well as the null points. To illustrate, let's consider a trial of surgery for sciatica secondary to lumbar disc disease. Surgeon 1 may use symptom severity as his index of indication, while surgeon 2 may use the duration of symptoms. It is likely that surgeon 1 will be in equipoise and randomise over a fairly narrow range of pain severities. On the other hand, as this surgeon is not using pain duration, they will randomise over a wide range of durations. The converse is true for surgeon 2. The result is that randomization will occur over a larger range of both severity and duration than it would if only one index was used. Neither is there any need for all investigators or patients to use the same outcome measure, as long as they are all collected. The outcome measure used may vary from patient to patient and clinician to clinician, and the same patient and clinician may use different measures on different occasions. This property could be useful when investigating treatments with significant ethical dilemmas, such as the treatment of preterm infants or anyone with a serious head injury where lives may be saved at the cost of severe disability. Outcomes of survival and quality of life could be available. Let's look at decompressive craniectomy as a treatment for raised intracranial pressure after traumatic brain injury. After a severe head injury, the brain is prone to swelling. This swelling happens inside the skull, which allows little space for expansion, so it can lead to increased pressure in the head. This makes it difficult to blood to get to the brain, which is then at risk of not having enough glucose and oxygen for normal functioning, as well as having to recover from the injury. Brain damage in addition to that caused directly by the injury may result, leading to a worse permanent disability or death. Treatment is aimed at preventing this additional brain damage by controlling swelling and consequent raised pressure, so maintaining blood flow. Several drug treatments are available for this, but they do not work in everyone, and the pressure may still rise dangerously in some people despite their use. A surgical operation called decompressive craniectomy is available for these patients. In this operation, a large piece of skull is removed to create space into which the brain can expand, relieving the pressure. This is thought to save lives, but many of the survivors have permanent and severe disability. A null-seeking trial of the treatment could be launched in which the proportion of cases surviving was one outcome measure and the quality of life among the survivors was another. Both of these could be plotted against an index of indication, perhaps the rise in intracranial pressure. 
We could then make distinctions, such as that between a low chance of survival but a high quality of life among survivors, and a high chance of survival but a low quality of life among survivors. Such distinctions are likely to be important in informing our decision making. Using two outcomes would not only facilitate the conduct of the trial as we saw in the case of using two indices, but it would also make the result more valuable. A different situation is where there are two related outcome measures, such as length of survival and length of good quality survival in the treatment of cancers. Using the two outcomes would enable situations with long, poor quality and short, good quality survival to be distinguished from those with short, poor quality and long-term, good quality survival.